I want to begin my study by reading the book of 1 John, a familiar passage from chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, where John says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. For a little time tonight, I'm going to talk to you about the subject of the Christian and entertainment. And as Shahay mentioned a moment ago, this was a topic I had a few years ago at the Labor Day meeting. Well, since that time, I've thought about it some more than I had then. And after Shaw had talked to me about doing this last year, I thought about it even more. And I've decided that really maybe the more appropriate title and focus of this study is to call it the Christian and pop culture. Now, when we talk about the Christian and pop culture, then that also raises questions, as I'll illustrate, of how did we get where we are in our world today as we see it and know it, when we compare it to the way that it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago with regard to the entertainment venues and the morality issues all tangled up in that. And so tonight what I want to do is spend a little time with some background, some history, to kind of bring us to where we are today and then close out with some principles that are nothing new, things you've heard before, but they're still timely and true principles for today. A little while ago, a few days ago, I told a brother that I was going to talk on the Christian and pop culture. And this brother was a member of the church. And I was a little surprised when he asked me the question, well, what is pop culture? And I thought, well, you know, that's really a good question. I just assumed that since I had heard it along through the years and had a general idea of what it means, that everyone did, but that's not necessarily true. In fact, when you read about it a little bit, you find out that I don't think anyone knows what the definition of pop culture is. In other words, there's a lot of opinions about what is included under this little sociological title that you hear about a lot today. Whole books have been written on the matter of the definition and significance of pop culture. One little book that I read during the last year or so is written by a man by the name of Steve Turner, who is a journalist, a writer, and a poet, and an avowed Christian living in London. And he wrote a book published in 2013 called Pop Cultured. And the title of that book, the title rather of the introduction of that book, is We've Been Pop Cultured. And I think that's a pretty good statement, and I hope I'll illustrate why that is a significant statement tonight. He lists in his first chapter or so uh, some examples and definitions of pop culture, and I'm going to use what he had to say and uh, present those as my definition with a little modification. He says that pop culture includes movies, television, comedy, fashion, newspapers, magazines, photography, the Internet, radio, celebrity culture, including actors, sports figures, and musicians, advertising, novels of every sort, cartoons, video games, sporting events, slang language, dancing, and most popular music. And I would say that includes more than just rock and roll. Also, he says that some definitions would include graffiti, body art, which is piercing and tattooing, and then also even bumper stickers and t-shirt slogans, and maybe a lot of other things. In fact, in other words, much of what we're all familiar with in the modern age in which we live. Now this is a tall order, and there's a lot of stuff here, and I'm not going to talk about all of this. I'm not going to give you a, a list of movies that you can't watch, or a list of television shows that you shouldn't turn on. I am going to say, though, that my conclusion is, and not just from this study, but from observation through the years, that much of what is put out there for public consumption really isn't much fit for Christian consumption. Well, I said I was going to give some background, and so I want to do that for the purpose of clarifying what we mean by pop culture, or what sociologists mean by the term. Sociologists have a distinction between folk culture and pop culture. 
Now, these two things are, are not necessarily mutually exclusive. In fact, they are somewhat overlapping in their significance. But in order to find a time when you can find folk culture that is basically undiluted, if you will, by modern pop culture, you've got to go back a long way. You've got to go back to the 19th century, so the historians and social historians tell us. Folk culture is essentially no local in nature. The local community basically influences itself. And the local community influences itself, and the young and the old within the community are influenced almost exclusively by parents and local peers, the extended family, neighbors, and the church. Now, when we say the church, of course, we mean historically it could be, include denominationalism of the 19th century, and yes, the denominations taught false doctrine, but in general, they were in agreement about morality, which we aren't today in our world as we all know. Even in those days, often the pop culture icons, if you wanted to call them that, which really they wouldn't technically quite be parallel, but mostly popular icons were preachers who came through the area and preached because a lot of people didn't hear a lot of preaching. And in that circumstance, uh, Grandpa might entertain the kids and the family with the fiddle on a cold winter night or in the summertime, uh, recreation and entertainment, when there was any, if they had time for any, consisted essentially of events involving the local community on some sort or another. In other words, in those days there was not what we might call the centralized electronic media complex, such as we have in the world today, that basically is held in the hands by, of people, godless people, who seem to be actively and intentionally working to advance immorality in the world. In those days, as we all know, there was no radio, no television, no movies, no internet, no YouTube, none of that, of course. Consequently, there could not, listen, there could not be in that day and time because of the social constructs of Frank Sinatra, an Elvis Presley, a Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Donnie and Marie, David Bowie, Lady Gaga, Miley Cyrus, or Katy Perry. In fact, if those people had come on the scene, they would likely have been brought to trial and put in jail. Now, in short, in those days and times, there was no Hollywood, no New York, and no Nashville, as we know them today. However, all of that began to change in the 20th century, when pop culture, as sociologists call it, began to emerge, and as it emerged, it grew rapidly and has had a century worth of time to be on the increase. Now, that doesn't mean folk culture doesn't exist in the 20th century or even in the 21st century. It just means that folk culture today has become engulfed and dwarfed by the tsunami of pop culture. That's why when you go to a local school event, you're going to see something or hear something there that is essentially a reflection of what's in the pop culture, which 150 years ago would not be seen or heard. Now then, there were two significant developments that took place in the 20th century, and I met, neglected to mention at the beginning that I know I run the risk of reductionism here. That's a fancy way of saying oversimplifying. I know that I'm leaving out many, many factors of a century worth of time in the, in the 1900s. I just want to call a couple of attention to a couple of things that in the reading I did stood out in my mind as particularly significant relative to the rise and influence of popular culture in the 20th century and now into the 21st century. The first of these is the rise of high school youth culture. Now, I don't want to make anyone nervous here. I just want to point out a social trend that has been an effect in all of this. Prior to the 1930s, most teenagers worked on farms for a living, or in factories, or at home, or whatever the family needed. Now, we could argue about whether that was better or worse. That's not the point. I'm just telling you the history and the trends and the effects of those trends. Now, for the first time in the 1930s, a majority of teenage kids 
started attending high school. You know, at that time, a lot of parents and kids considered it a complete waste of time, and some did not want to see compulsory school attendance laws for kids over a certain age because they were needed for the economic welfare of the family. You know, as a matter of fact, it was almost the end of the century, 1936, or in the middle of the uh, decade, rather, of the 30s, when it was still only then 65% of the young who became high school students. You know, there are still a few people in the church, old enough, though they're quite old now, to remember that period of time. Well, what we see then is that by the mid-1940s, a decade later, marketers and entrepreneurs were beginning to recognize the teenage market as a matter of a, a, a sector of the population with tremendous financial potential. And as a larger and larger majority of kids began attending high school and it became the norm, a whole industry, listen, a whole industry of products and services and media offerings unknown before were offered up and directed to kids under the age of 20. Prior to this time, no one ever thought of such a thing. In fact, I was kind of surprised, or maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was, thought it was interesting at least to learn that we have a common word in our English language today that did not exist in the English language before the 1940s. Teenager. There was not a word for it because there was not a separate class of people in society who were segregated in that sense. And so the term teenager, which has become a part of our everyday language, was unknown only a few decades ago. Well, nearly a century ago now, or close to it. Well, as marketers began to direct products and services to these kids, and after World War II, when there was a lot of prosperity in the economy, people had extra money, they could give their kids extra money, and this, of course, enabled the kids to purchase the products and services that were offered to them. And with this kind of economic and social clout, the young, for the first time in American history, and perhaps for the first time in all of history, the young and the values of the young and the inexperienced began to drive the culture. Prior to that time, it was the adults who, whose principles and whose life experience and which taught them the better life or the right and wrong and the reason for things being right and wrong, uh, that was placed secondary. Prior to this, the, the adults drove the culture because there wasn't the young component I've mentioned. So you see the progression or the changes that take place. Now then, I find an article in time.com entitled, How American High School Students Invented the Modern Way of Dating. Two things about that. It's Time Magazine. It's not a religious journal. Number two, let that title soak in a little bit. How American High School Students Invented the Modern Way of Dating. Well, let's take a look at this. Parents sent their children to school longer. That is, parents in the context of the article, parents in the 40s, 30s and 40s, sent their children to school longer, meaning up to an older age. In other words, not just grade school or grammar school, as it was known. Parents in the 30s and 40s sent their children to school longer than just grade school and allowed them to a great deal more leisure than they themselves had enjoyed at that same age. Ironically, the more they gave their children, the less influence they exerted over them. And look at this. That role was taken over by their peers. Now, I've colored that to emphasize it. But as young people started spending less time with their families and more time with one another, they created their own culture. Now, I think those are significant statements coming from this magazine and are worth our attention. The role of influence over the young was taken over by their peers. This reminds me of old Rehoboam back there in the Old Testament, you remember, who because of his position in society as king, he was able to be 
uh, make a choice between being influenced by the older or by the younger, and he opted to be influenced by the younger. Now then, I look at this, and I think about this, and I think about the effects of this, and I consider this idea. And that is that when a society creates an aggregate outside the home of millions and millions and millions of young developing minds with no life experience and raging hormones, where they can influence each other more than they do their parent or more than their parents do, and then gives them extra money and plenty of leisure time, and then add to the mix marketers who have more interest in the dollar than in morality, such a society can expect nothing but major changes to happen over the course of a century. That's my assessment of this situation. Now, I'm not picking on kids here in this audience tonight because I'm talking about the teenagers of a century or more. That includes every person in this room. Every one of us have been either a teenager or the parent of a teenager, and some of us the grandparents of teenagers, sometime within the rise of the pop culture era. Now then, that means that anything we say here tonight is relevant to all of us as young people and old people. The second important development of the 20th century that coincides with this is the rise of the electronic mass media. And I should have added the word complex at the end. I think that gives it more of the uh, flavor that it really has. The rise of the electronic mass media complex. Now, that just simply means that we live today in an era where we are literally immersed in the messages of this media that is around us. Now, I didn't start that way. We can trace some brief history here. Photography was invented in the late 19th century. Well, it was invented earlier than that, but it became prominent in the late 19th century. There's a great book, some of you may have read it, called Amusing Ourselves to Death by, by uh, Neil Postman. He makes a great case in that book for the fact that photography, the invention of photography, now we don't think a thing about it, we're so accustomed to it, we don't even realize the effect that it had on the people and the society in which it was first introduced. He makes the point that even photography itself had an influence on people in the sense that prior to photography's introduction into magazines and newspapers, all advertising was propositional. That is to say, buy this product for this and this and this and this logical reason. And ads would be a whole block of text advertising some product. Can you imagine getting people to read that today? Now, the other part of that is, is when photography came along, he said not only did the ads change in their, in their um, look, but in the emphasis. So that it became a matter of buy this product because it will influence your image with other people. That's just a striking thing. It, it's so common today we don't even think about it, but at the time, it was apparently quite a thing. So that's just one step back there at the beginning. Moving pictures came along a couple of decades later. Now the pictures move. Then the phonograph, which we call record sales, came along actually in the early 1900s. Radio came on the rise in 1920s. Movies with sound. They took the audio and the visual and the moving visual and combined them. This was revolutionary. So much for granted to us today. But then came television in the 1950s and computers on the internet or in the internet in the 80s and 90s. And essentially, the rest is history. Well, in general, we know what's happened. When we consider and look back and, and look at the long-term consequences of the introduction of these things, what we see now is a world in which, in general, the control of these venues has become centralized and has fallen into the hands of those who see media in all of its forms, not only as a tool to get filthy rich, but also 
to mold and change public opinion. Now, I'm not one of those folks today who believes that there's something inherently wrong with photography or that there's something inherently wrong with the internet or television or any of these things I've mentioned. I'm just saying that when you introduce a technology, it will have ramifications that are usually unforeseen and sometimes can have extensive moral consequences and ramifications. And that's where we are today. Now, uh, the result is then that when the power of the control of these venues is centralized and held in the hands of the ungodly, then the young become the primary audience. Why? Because it's the young who are the most malleable. It's the young who can be most convinced. And it's the young who potentially have the longest lifespan ahead of them who can continue to be consumers of the products going forward. The old, we're not going to be around that much longer. And we're all solidified in our way of thinking. But the young can be influenced. And my, is that what we have seen in the last 120 years? So that is why, or one of the reasons why, is certainly not comprehensive, a comprehensive explanation, but that is partly why Lady Gaga has more admirers today than any 10 preachers of morality combined in the country. And fill in the gap, whether it's Lady Gaga or whoever, whoever else it is. Now I want to say, I think there is some glimmer of, of hope here, perhaps, in the internet. I think the internet has fragmented some of this to a degree. And that's a good sign, unless the government ever decides to take control of it, and that will be the end of that. Well, as we go on then, I want to read an article, or a section of an article, called The New Morality by a social and religious commentator by the name of Kirby Anderson. I used to listen to him years ago in the 80s when I lived in Springfield, and I was surprised to see his name pop up where he's still out there writing and speaking. But anyway, he said that, uh, or in his article he wrote, George Barna says, we are witnessing the development and acceptance of a new moral code in America in 2015. He explains, quote, mosaics, and that's George Barna's term for the age group of those between 18 and 24, and I can explain that, but I'm not gonna take the time to do it right now. It's not got anything to do with the law of Moses. Mosaics <laughs> have little exposure to traditional moral teaching and limited accountability for such behavior. The moral code began to disintegrate when the generation before them, the baby busters, ages 25 to 43, pushed the limits that had been challenged by their parents, the baby boomers. That's my age group, those 44 to 62. That's the 60s and the 70s. He goes on, this is now Anderson's comment, For years I have been saying that these two major shifts in morality took place for different reasons. When many baby boomers rejected traditional morality in the 1960s and 70s, they were doing it consciously. They knew they were crossing a line. But when the current generation engages in these behaviors, often they are not even aware they are crossing a line. Most of them don't even know where the lines of traditional morality are. I had to use that statement. That is, that is, that's an excellent statement. So the effects of a century of pop culture, and I would say a lot of other influences, are now layered and entrenched multi-generationally. That makes me think back to my earlier experiences of hearing people talk about what the preachers used to say in the 40s and 50s. I heard a conversation at the back of the room before church tonight that some used to be opposed to, I love Lucy. Can you imagine that? Now then, the preachers in those days, some of them were warning us of the music and movies and televisions of 40s and 50s or 30s, 40s and 50s, and yet now we laugh at that. My, how our thinking has really changed in this period of time. They warned us about things that now seem innocent. Maybe we need to rethink that. Well, I could spend time talking about the content of pop culture, but we know what we're talking about. 
We're talking about sex, profanity, violence, galore. We're talking about the glorification and the palatization of witchcraft and the occult. We're talking about, moreover, and I've heard people talk about how the movies, oh, well, it doesn't have profanity, it doesn't have violence, it's just a great story, but I've observed through the years, and you can call me a prude if you want, but I've observed through the years that many movies and television and this kind of thing are tinged and maybe saturated with fairy tale versions of love and romance that only set young people up for disillusionment, disappointment, and in some cases divorce after they get married. And I suppose there's a thousand other criticisms that could be offered, but that we know about these things. I just thought it would only be complete to put it up here. So let me go to the next point. There are some common misconceptions about pop culture that I want to address for a few minutes. And this is not all of them by any stretch, but I'll present the ones I have time for. First of all, there's a common point of view that says it's just entertainment. I've heard people make this argument in reference to a lot of things that really are not really worth the time it takes to entertain oneself with. It's just entertainment. People say, well, you know, it's um, entertainment is simply to relax and to escape from the pressures of the world. And I don't really want to concern myself with a lot of morality principles and that kind of thing. And besides that, I am grounded in the Word of God. And I know the difference between right and wrong, and therefore I'm going to consume whatever I think I want to consume. Well, let me add some points to that. This view ignores the proven fact that what we take into our minds does influence our attitudes, behaviors, and behaviors. I ran across a statement in a book that I read uh, a few months ago that I, I guess I was aware of, but I just seeing it in print just solidified it for me. And that is that, did you know, in the first decade of the 1900s, that is from the year 1900 to 1910, psychology, which had been in existence for about 50 years before that, psychology was already, and maybe before that, but was already being used in advertising in the early 20th century. This tells me that advertisers and people who are out to get their hand in your pocket know that you are influenced by the way you think, and if you can be made to think a certain way about a certain product, you're more likely to buy that thing. So this is a proven fact that we are influenced by what we see and hear. It also ignores the fact that the producers of pop culture are obviously intelligent and talented people. And their art is very, very advanced and impressive. And moreover, many of them see their art as only a tool to mold public opinion. Now I'm told that in the business, they call this pushing the envelope. I don't know, that may be an outdated phrase by now, I don't know. Some of you recognize this man, George Carlin. I'm not here tonight to pick on George Carlin. I use him as an example because of some of the things he said in an interview. And I thought, well, what he says here gets at the idea that I want to make, and that is it's not just entertainment. Let's notice. Uh, uh, George Carlin says, once you get people laughing, they're listening. And you can tell them almost anything. In case you don't know, George Carlin was a comedian. He passed away in 2008. He was very, very popular when I was in high school in the 70s. He may have been more popular since then, but I never paid much attention to him after the 70s. But he was very popular as a comedian. Once you get people laughing, he says they're listening, and you can tell them almost anything. Most of the time, when you talk to people about issues, and he means controversial things, People have their defenses up. They are going to defend their point of view, the thing they're used to, the ideas they hold dear, and you have to take a long, logical route to get through to them. But he goes on. But when you are doing comedy and humor, people are open, and when the 
moment of laughter comes, their guard is down, so new data can be introduced more easily at that moment. I love the jokes, he said, but the jokes are there to decorate the ideas. Now, again, I quote Mr. Carlin not because I'm picking on him. I quote him because of the fact that if you look at what Mr. Carlin says a lot of the time, you may actually agree with some of the things that he tries to introduce as um, things that are, are uh, hypocritical about society or whatever. But there are a lot of things that you would not agree with. And so my point is, it's not just entertainment. In fact, in the last interview that I took the time to watch on YouTube of Mr. Carlin, he made the point that, I forget who it was, someone called him a philosopher, a, a jester, philosopher, poet. And I thought, well, he is a jester. That means a jokester, someone who makes jokes. But he's also, and proud of the title, a philosopher and a poet. Yes, he is a philosopher. So it's not just entertainment. This man here, Michael Cashman, you may not have heard of him. I hadn't, but I'm not always on the cutting edge of pop culture. Michael Cashman was a British actor turned politician, and he was the first actor to deliver a homosexual kiss on British primetime television in 1987. In 1987, that caused a public backlash. Don't think that would happen today so much. In response to the backlash, here's what Mr. Cashman said. Public taste has to be, I'm going to emphasize my, the part of this I want to emphasize. Public taste has to be developed. Public opinion has to be led. And television and the media are central to that. Now, I use this 32-year-old example because I know I could use later information and later quotes. I use this old one simply to make the point they were telling us this 30 years ago. Now, we didn't have as easy access to information back then, but it was out there, and they were telling us. And all we're seeing now is the effect of it in another three, after another three decades. Not surprisingly, today, Mr. Cashman is the Labour Party in Britain, the Labour Party special envoy on LGBTQ issues worldwide. It seems that an acting career for Mr. Cashman was not the do-all and end-all of life like some people think it is. In fact, it was only for him, apparently, a rung on the ladder to an even more influential sphere of activity. My friends, it's not just entertainment, and it hasn't been just entertainment for a long, long time. Well, I'm going to skip this. I, I want to make sure I have plenty of time. But he did. This young man here, Angus T. Jones, played Jake Harper on Two and a Half Men. When he became a, close to adulthood, he converted to Seventh-day Adventism and quit the show. Some of you may know this. I didn't know this till about a month ago. But he quit the show a few years ago, and here's what he said when he was asked why. Please stop filling your head with filth. Please. People say it's just entertainment. Watch out. A lot of people don't like to think how deceptive the enemy is. He's been doing this a lot longer than any of us have been around. And you cannot be a true God-fearing person and be on a show like that. I would say, well, you can't be a God-fearing person and watch a show like that. I haven't seen it. But I know this. I don't have to watch it. I know I don't have to, because when an actor from that show says a statement like this, I know I don't have to watch it, and shouldn't. Well, anyway, a second popular misconception about pop culture is that when I hear some people in my generation, or a little older, say something like this, today's pop culture is bad, but that of my generation was okay. Well. It may be true that more of it was okay, but not all of it. And I'm not sure we were so discriminate, discriminating about how we consumed it back in those days. Well, let's go back a few years to the 90s. If we go back to the 90s, it's only a precursor to the day, today. If you go back to the 80s, you have Madonna and Cyndi Lauper. If you go back to the 70s of my generation, the music of the sexual revolution, 
and the so-called new morality, I ask you, was there any sexual innuendo or explicit reference in any of the music at that time? Do we still listen to it in our car? You know, we could go back to the 60s. I hear people, members of the church, oh, I love the Beatles. Well, I want to tell you, if you were a Christian in the 1960s, at the age you are now, if you're an adult, you would probably not have. And not just because of their haircuts. If you had come to the knowledge at the time, and maybe it was not that well known except to the initiated, that uh, their song, Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds, was simply a song about an LSD trip. The 60s were not that great. Someone says, well, what about country music? Well... Country music's full of traditionalism and family values, right? And such. True, perhaps. Country music is also well known, and not just in the modern era, but when I was a boy and before, is known for its constant spewing out of themes of drunkenness and adultery and cheating and divorce, and on goes the list. In fact, in the early 60s, there was a song, if you can imagine, it was controversial. In 1961, a player, a singer by the name of Leroy Van Dyke had a song called Just Walk On By. And it was about a man saying to his mistress, if you meet me in town, if you see me on the sidewalk, walk on by, don't talk to me because my wife will find out. Or she might. This was controversial. But less than a decade later, you have a show like Hee Haw. And I confess, my friends, I grew up on it. It was in our house, because my dad, who's not a member of the church, was into that country music. And I'll tell you something, friends. What was the appeal of that program but the girls? And part of them appeared in Playboy magazine. I'd say most of the American viewing public at that time didn't know that, and maybe don't know it today. And then later they became known as the Hee Haw Honeys. Now what is... Five decades done since then. Well, five decades has basically surrounded us with hee-haw honey wannabes in every store in America from the ages of 14 to 70. This is a shame, but we can expect it from the world, but we should not consume it as entertainment. Well, I have so much more, but I need to hasten on. I'm about to run out of time, in fact. There's one other point that I want to make here, and that is selective righteous indignation. This I think I probably should have spent more time on. Let me just use one example to illustrate this. I was talking to a member of the church just a few days ago, and the brother told me, he said, you know, I was watching House Hunters, or I think that's what it's called. I was watching House Hunters, and they had some gay couple on there or a lesbian couple, I don't know which it was, and he said, I turned that thing off. And he says, I'm going to turn that off. And he says, I don't care who knows it. And whoever knows it, I don't care how much trouble I get in. That's what he told me. The irony is, two weeks before that, I was in that brother's house, and there was another similar show on where a couple, man and woman, shacking up, were ordering a tiny house. And whenever the couple came, on the scene, came into the program and they started describing them, I turned to this brother and I said, well, they're fornicating. <laughs> they're shacking up. And he just kind of laughed. and said, well, yeah, I guess they are. And you know what? We went on watching the show. And if it's on next week, it'll probably be on again. Now, this is selective righteous indignation. Now, my friends, I realize that it's a perfectly innocent thing to watch a show that tells the story about people going around buying houses. But whenever they go into the house and from room to room to room to room, out of their mouth comes the OMG statement, I'm not going to sit there and watch it. I don't care if they're married. That is just an offense. And I'm not going to leave it on just because, as one sister told me, I just want to see the house. There comes a time when we need to decide whether or not our indignation and righteousness is going to be selective or consistent.
And this is an important aspect of all of this. Well, I'm not going to go into detail on these. I want to get to the principles as I round this out. I have five minutes. One idea is that it's bad content, but it's great art. The, super, uh, the, the, the special effects are, are marvelous. Or the book, the novel has a horrid story, but oh, is he ever a great writer. How many times have we heard that? Or all cultural changes are relative. I know people, even people, I've known people in the church who really aren't too concerned about their kids living in fornication. And so their response is, well, you know, things change. The music changes. We don't wear, we don't wear bell bottoms anymore. And kids just shack up these days. And it didn't seem to bother him. Well, I'm going to spend my last three minutes and 50 seconds <laughs> with biblical principles that I saved to the end because I know we already know this stuff. I want to consider the question, what can the righteous do? You know, the psalmist, Psalm 11 and verse 3, asks this very profound question and relevant question. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's a great question. Most people, it seems to me, are perfectly content to be carried along undiscerningly in the tide and the gulf of all of this immorality that is so powerfully and skillfully portrayed before us. But the Christian has an obligation to be different. We have an obligation to make a stand for what we know to be right. And we need to have vigilance and be discerning in what we consume as entertainment rather than simply take whatever comes along without any forethought and get our kids involved and then we realize we've got a problem when we're already in the middle of it. So I want to highlight some biblical points here quickly. First of all, entertainment impinges upon a wise use of time. Paul said in Ephesians 5 verses 15 through 17, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Use discernment. I've already touched on this, but Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14, Paul says, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses discern, exercised to discern both good and evil. Does that not apply to the things that we watch and listen to and sing along with in the car and observe and view and post and like on Facebook? Oh, I'd like to say a lot about Facebook, but I guess I don't have time. I, I, I do have an account, by the way. But you're not going to see much from me on there except something that has to do with the church or something to that effect. But Psalm 101 and verse 3, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. Well, it will if we aren't careful. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know when you watch a movie? I don't watch many movies, so I become keenly aware of this whenever I watch one and how, how very powerfully it involves your whole thought processes and emotions. And you're carried along on this ride for two hours. Now I want to ask you a question. The next time you watch a movie, I want you to ask yourself, is the message conveyed here something that I want to be part of my thoughts? Am I looking forward to this person's revenge on another by taking their life? Or you name it. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, lovely, of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And then, quickly, I have 11 seconds. Proverbs 14, 16, Romans 13, 13, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, Colossians 2, 8, Colossians 3, 8, and I'm out of time.
I think these are important principles and I think you're all aware of those principles and I hope we'll be more discerning and more deliberate and intentional in our application of them.